Most everyone loves the Book of Ruth, with its bucolic settings, its charming loves, its grace, its devoted and worthy characters, Naomi, Boaz, and Ruth herself. But of course, alongside that appeal, the Book of Ruth also conveys truths about the human condition. It has something powerful to say about who children are and what they mean for the life of a woman, a family, and a nation. It has something to say about the complementary human and divine sources of redemption. It suggests and portrays a distinctly Hebraic answer to the questions about the shape of a human life. My name is Jonathan Silver. I'm the editor of Mosaic and the host of the Tikva podcast. On behalf of the Tikva Fund, I'm honored, in anticipation of Shavuot, to welcome the great Leon Cass to discuss a new book that he's co-authored with Hannah Mandelbaum, Reading Ruth, Birth, Redemption, and the Way of Israel, published in 2021 by Paul Dry Books. Leon Cass is, of course, an emeritus professor at the University of Chicago's Committee on Social Thought and an emeritus scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. He's the author of many books, including the full-length wisdom-seeking studies of Genesis and Exodus. He's now the Dean of Faculty at Shalem College in Jerusalem. His co-author, Hannah Mendelbaum, recently completed her army service in the Education Division of the Israeli Air Force and in the fall of this year will be enrolled in the Revivim program at the Hebrew University, where she will prepare to become a high school teacher of Jewish texts. Now, the origins of this book, a line-by-line commentary on Ruth, is itself a story as moving as the text it interprets. Chana Mandelbaum, you see, is the granddaughter of Leon Cass, and they began to read the book of Ruth together, while mourning Leon's late and beloved wife of 54 years and Hannah's grandmother, Amy Cass of blessed memory, that the two of them, grandfather and granddaughter, would turn together to the Hebrew Bible as a way to deepen their familial love in the midst of their grief, and for the two of them, moreover, to have together created this commentary that delights and elevates so many readers' encounter with the Hebrew Bible, is itself an instantiation of the chesed, the loyal devotion that is the central idea of Ruth. Feeling acutely the absence of their wife and grandmother, the granddaughter and husband of Amy Cass honor her with this book, and in so doing follow a path that Ruth herself treads, from desolation to gladness, with a distinguished Jewish future unfurling before us. Well, Leon Cass, welcome back to the Tikva Fund. John, it's wonderful to be back with you. I want to congratulate you and congratulate Hannah on the publication of this fabulous new book. We're going to discuss the insights that the two of you came to together um, and what it all means. Perhaps we should begin with a note that the two of you offer about the larger frame within which the story of Ruth takes place. The book begins with a reference to an earlier moment in biblical history, the book of Judges. And it alludes at the very end to a later moment in biblical history, the book of Samuel and the book of Kings, all of which would seem to suggest that the story of women and men we read about here is somehow connected to the larger story of the nation. So maybe I wanted to begin with some of the big themes that connect Ruth with the story of the rise of the nation of Israel, its fall, and it's hopeful promise that that nation will rise again. No, it's it's not commonly observed, but it really is, as you say, the outer frame of the book. It begins uh, in the days of the judging of judges, itself uh, a, a, a strange expression, and there is a famine in the land, and we're not told why there's a famine, but it's clear these are bad times. Um, And, uh, and the book ends uh, with the birth of a son to Ruth and Boaz, and we're told that that son is going to be the grandfather of King David, uh, the, uh, uh, the Lord's anointed and Israel's greatest king, who will unify the kingdom and put an end to the troubles that were rife during the uh, time of Judges. The question is, what does this, 
otherwise tame little domestic story of marriage, procreation, and land redemption have to do with that larger picture. Um, and uh, I, we can talk about this at length, but uh, I, I think among the things we want to see here is how this uh, tale of domestic life, uh, which is rather prosaic, um, is somehow of the essence for what uh, the people of Israel is all about. Why family, why land redemption in relation to the land, why the treatment of strangers, and why the virtue of chesed are crucial not just in interpersonal relations, but are crucial to the mission of Israel and the well-being of the people as a whole. There is a, a proposal, it seems to me, elaborated throughout not an argument as in Greek philosophy, but a story, um, as is the way of the Hebrew Bible's manner of instruction. There is an answer to uh, there is an answer to a deep set of questions. The answer seems to be marriage and family and child rearing. Um, what I'd like for us to do in the course of this conversation is to try to discover what those questions are what those questions are to which marriage and family is an answer. Um, but maybe this is the right place to begin. You and your co-author, Hannah, make much of the observation that when Elimelech and Naomi leave Bethlehem and go to Moab, they go with their sons, who in turn uh, take daughters of Moab as their wives, and live there for a full ten years without having children, why did that jump out to you, and what does that mean? Well, I mean, the the the, um, the striking thing, and this was Hannah's discovery, and it I think is the key to the entire book. Uh, Elimelech, Naomi, and their two sons leave Bethlehem in Judah during the time of the famine, and they go to what they hope will be greener pastures, and they find uh, the most unlikely place to go, the land of Moab which is the land of the inveterate enemy of the children of Israel. Uh, Moses says that uh, at no time is a Moabite to enter into this community, but they choose to go there and they dwell there. Elimelech dies, we're not told why, whether this is somehow punishment for the error of going. The two boys take Moabite wives and uh, they die after 10 years and we're not told why. And then the text says simply, and Naomi was left alone. And Hannah says to me, he says, 10 years, two families, no children. Here you have uh, the children of Israel in a foreign land, which means to them death, uh, death to the men and no generation and no procreation. And this really raises the question of, um, what is the status of birth and renewal in the world at large? And how important is it and how will it be somehow restored in the land of Israel? Uh, the theme of the whole story is in a way set by this problem, the problem of, uh, of procreation, perpetuation, which turns out to be absolutely central to the Israelite way of life in which perpetuation of a teaching is the heart of the way people live with mortality and uh, organize their entire communal life. But I, I think I want to understand a little more clearly about the particular identity of Moab and why it is, uh, for instance, wh why do you think that it's important for the story that Ruth is a Moabite and that this part of the story before their return to the land of Israel happens there? Well, um, Moab, uh, the original Moab, uh, the, the name means from the father. The original Moab was the son of the incestuous union between Lot and his older daughter when after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the two daughters make their father drunk. Each lies with their father and give birth to sons. The women were motivated by thinking they were the last women on earth, the last people on earth, and they had an obligation to people the world. So Moab, the original Moab, is uh, an incestuous son. 
uh, of, a, of a union which will turn out to be forbidden an abomination in Israel, part of Israel's holiness code presented in Leviticus 18. So that's the ancestry of Moab. Um, the second thing is that um, when Israel was coming back from Egypt to enter the promised land, uh, the, the king of, of Moab uh, sought uh, a prophet Bilam to pronounce a curse on the Israelites, but the Lord turns this curse into a blessing. Uh, the daughters of Moab tried to seduce the Israelite men and to lead them to go whoring after false gods, and they wouldn't provision them with food and water on the way through. So in every way, both in their origins and in, um, and in their conduct, they are persona non grata in Israel. And uh, it is the strangest thing of all that uh, in, in a way, in a way uh, the story begins with the antithesis of Israel, Israel living in the most antithetical and most hostile community. So the story is in a way set up at the beginning to see the difference of Israel and the difference it makes. That having been observed, one might think that Naomi's injunction to her uh, to her daughters that she go and return to their father's houses uh, upon the death of their husbands is a kind of insensitivity or coarseness of spirit. Um, given what you've just told us about the inversion of the, um, the, the, the moral inversion that one sees between the culture of Israel and the culture of Moab. But in fact, you and Hannah argue almost exactly the opposite that there is a deep human uh, and humane compel, uh, compulsion that moves Naomi to argue out of mercy that, her, uh, that, that Orpah and Ruth should return to their father's houses. Why don't you just explain what you think, psycho, what, why don't you just explain what, you, what uh, psychological impulses you find in Naomi at work there? Um, look, uh, Naomi, uh, at, from the very beginning to the very end, you could say is the, 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 the patron and the prophet of marriage and children. Um, the, when she sees that the daughter-in-laws want to return with her back to, to, to the land of Israel, she urges them to go back because there's no prospect of remarriage for them there. Uh, she wants them to find uh, rest rest in the home of their of, of new husbands. And from the point of view of Naomi, uh, a woman is restless until she can be married, until she can give birth, until she can somehow fulfill that for the sake of which she alone um, can uh, offer the world, which is to say the antidote to mortality, which woman carries in her body. Um, and uh, Naomi wishes that above all for her daughters. She doesn't want their company. She wants their fulfillment. Um, and she knows that uh, there, will be, there will be little hope for remarriage back in the land of Israel, where these daughter-in-laws will be um, from a hated enemy and not welcome in the community at all. Their only hope for remarriage uh, would be to stay where they are. And in fact, uh, with one of the daughters-in-law, Orpah, she makes her case and she persuades her. But Ruth is adamant, and in the very great speech for which the book is famous, um, Ruth um, declares that uh, I'm perfectly prepared to give up uh, any prospect of future marriage. Uh, I, in fact, espouse myself to you. If one looks at Ruth's great speech, um, and um, it's just immensely moving, wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your gods will be my God. And where you die, I will die, and I will be buried uh, with you. Um, it's, it's a beautiful speech, but uh, one has to notice this is a speech that is normally the kind of speech a bride would make to a groom or vice versa. And Naomi, Ruth is basically pledging herself as a spouse 
to her mother-in-law. Um, and um, it turns out that uh, when, when Ruth finishes this great speech, we expect something from Naomi. I mean, it's, it, it is a conversation stopper, to be sure, but we expect to hear something from Naomi. And the text says, and when Naomi saw she couldn't persuade her, she kept silent. And they went, the two of them, all the way to Bethlehem, a two weeks journey. And one would like to imagine they might have even been silent the whole way because each of them is thinking and standing for different thoughts. It looks like Ruth has won the argument, um, but Naomi is resigned, but she hasn't really given in the principle. And for the rest of the whole story, Naomi secretly, quietly has got her eye on the question, how can I find a suitable husband for this most worthy of daughters-in-law? Okay, so that would seem to suggest that though it has a show-stopping um, elegance to it, Ruth's speech would seem to be the last word on the matter. In point of fact, um, as you and Hannah read that speech, it, it, it opposes the ethic that Naomi has in mind, um, and indeed that you interpret the way of Israel to essentially stand for. It's a discordant note. Well, it, I mean, look, it, it's, it's quite complicated. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the author wrote her a great speech. She is the heroine of this book. The book is named for her, not as one might sometimes think it should have been named for Naomi, and maybe we could touch on that at some point. Um, but um, Ruth makes a speech for eternal friendship. Eternal friendship is sterile. Naomi makes a speech for marriage, and she makes a speech for regeneration and rebirth, which is the only answer to mortality, that of her own husband and her own sons, that of individuals, and in a way, that for a nation altogether. Um, we have joined very early in the opening chapter the the con the the a contest in a way between the principle of friendship and the princi principle of fruitful marriage. And um, uh, the speech of Ruth uh, occurs three-fourths of the way through the book. It's the book's first word on the subject, but if you follow through to the end, it's not the last word. And in fact, the principle of Naomi will get the last word. So uh, I want to before we move on too quickly past it, um, of course, it's simply not the case that the um, answer of family and perpetuation is the only question is the only answer to the human uh, dilemmas and terrors of mortality. The uh, other civilizations and other ways of life have offered their own answers, and I wonder if maybe this is an opportunity to expand a little on just how unique and significant. The, uh, the answer of Naomi is to that question. One could imagine, uh, by contrast, the way that Achilles might answer the question of death, uh, or the way that uh, the, the other exemplars of human excellence might answer that question, the way that Socrates might answer that question. Naomi's answer seems to be unique and to carry with it a uniquely Hebraic insight into the human condition. Um, look, that's quite lovely, and we touch on some of these things in the generalizations towards the end of the book. Um, uh, before one gets to, uh, to uh, Achilles and Socrates, we can bring them back, um, but in the context of the Hebrew Bible, the leading alternatives against which the way of Israel is defined are the Egyptians on the one hand uh, behind and the Canaanites in front. Uh, the Egyptians uh, have their own response to mortality. It's embalming and the hope and effort at reanimation, uh, the opportunity, at least for the pharaohs, to have eternal life once the magicians can figure out how to reverse what happened while the body is being kept uh, intact, awaiting that discovery of the reanimating principle. Um, and that, so the Egyptian answer is like the answer of some of modern science, 
let's uh, go to war with death itself and enable people to live on and on and on and in the limit forever. Uh, the Canaanite practice is, in a way, just the reverse. Uh, eat, drink, and be merry. Um, we will indulge ourselves to the full. We will merge with the earthy gods and celebrate our time here. And um, procreation is, is uh, procreation is not the thing. Uh, the way of Israel, uh, in fact, begins very strikingly. The first mitzvah in the, in the Bible is to be fruitful and multiply. And if you assume that God doesn't waste his commandments, but has to sort of enjoin things that might be not altogether with the natural grain, I mean, the animals are fruitful and multiply by instinct. The human beings, in a way, might be tempted to enjoy themselves here and now rather than sacrifice pleasures of the moment for the care of the next generation. But the Israelites are defined, really, against the seeking of bodily immortality for yourself or somehow dancing in the face of mortality and living it up uh, orgiastically now, uh, an alternative that shows itself in Israel uh, at the golden calf when all of those restraints are let loose and Dionysus, the god really of the earth and pleasures, uh, uh, is let loose. It's true that uh, in other cultures, the pursuit of glory, of eternal fame for yourself, to be sung of because you've gone to face death armed only by your own courage and prowess, as in the case of Achilles, is an alternative. And it depends on there being a poet who can sing your glory. And the, the, the alternative of Achilles will not preserve the civilization to remember him. For that, you need less heroic, less manly figures. Um, and in fact, uh, the Hebrew Bible, towards the beginning, rejects that kind of manly view of the uh, male alternative and, in fact, domesticates it in the service of perpetuation and transmission of a way of life. In Israel, circumcision is given when a son is eight days old to remind the father of his duties, covenantally speaking, instead of in other cultures when you circumcise the males when they leave the community of women and children and join the warrior party. So, and then the example of Socrates is also, um, from the point of view of perpetuation, sterile. Um, Socrates follows the path of seeking the eternal truth through philosophy, but, and we're very grateful that we're open to that possibility and can study it. But uh, the civilization that gave birth to Achilles and Socrates is gone. The civilization that emphasized transmission, perpetuation, procreation, and not only those things. We've so far talked really primarily about the question of marriage and family um, as, a, as the instrument of transmitting a way of life that harkens back to a covenant uh, which has the entire uh, people uh, informed by the desire to look up to an eternal God, who, by the way, is uh, uh, the, the foundation of the, the, the real answer to mortality. It's not just that there are children that come after, but the whole way of life is informed by and in relation to an eternal God uh, which relationship in part redeems our own finitude. We're party not just to a biological line and not just even to a kind of culture, but it's a culture that is informed by, looks up to, and um, is taught by um, the Lord God of Israel, who is the creator of all and the teacher of Israel, of a way of life that can enable us to live more in accordance with what it means to be a righteous and a holy nation, to be holy as the Lord our God is holy. Okay, that's exactly where I wanted to go next. Uh, we've spoken about one crucial dimension of Ruth's answer to Naomi, and that is the dimension of love and friendship. But of course, there's a theological statement made in the midst of that speech as well. Ruth not only promises 
to make Naomi's people her people. She also promises to make Naomi's God her God. I wonder if you could just elaborate on the theological significance of, of Ruth's uh, impulse, her point of view, her orientation to this point in her life before they enter into Bethlehem. Um, actually, um, I know that it's fairly common traditionally to, um, to read this as, in a way, Ruth's embrace of, uh, of, of Judaism and of the teachings of the Torah, and that this is, in a way, a conversion. And we don't read it that way. Um, she, she's just been told, go back to your own gods. Uh, and she says, uh, no, I'm going with you. And uh, I think she says, your people will be my people and your God will be my God um, because they're yours. It's not that she somehow understood what she's going to, but anything that is Naomi's, she will love because she loves Naomi. That's the formulation of it. Uh, there's no indication, there's no indication that she's uh, theologically embracing the God of Israel at this point. Um, and in fact, the whole notion of conversion is an anachronism. Uh, conversion doesn't become an issue in Israel really until the Middle Ages when other people made it an, an issue for us. And at that particular point, the story of Ruth is sort of ready to hand as a kind of alternative teaching. But I would say um, Ruth goes really worshipfully of Naomi, and uh, she, she's willing to take a chance. She's bravely leaving her own people. She's leaving behind her gods. She's going to go and embrace whatever the god is back home. And the question is whether this love of Naomi might in fact turn out to have theological implications for Ruth, and even more, whether they might have theological implications for Naomi, who has basically um, uh, feels that God has abandoned her, that uh, in fact one of the reasons she's doubtful about having Ruth come back with her, she's afraid that Ruth will suffer the misfortunes that the Lord God of Israel has seen fit to inflict on her. Um, so we find Naomi not in a terribly uh, pious mood when she returns, and the question is whether it's somehow the, the chesed, the the, the loyal devotion and gracious kindness that is Ruth's singular virtue and which she has shown here to Naomi, whether that teaching can bring Naomi back to her own God and Ruth along with her. So I would not read this theological beginning as anything very powerful there. It's pregnant with possibilities, but we have to wait and see. Let me uh, try to advance one of those possibilities. I don't want to, I don't think the text yet allows us to uh, find it fully there, um, but certainly a possibility. Uh, Leon, some of our listeners and viewers will be familiar with the very powerful painting by the Italian painter Caravaggio of the conversion of St. Paul, in which the apostle is uh, fallen off, off of his horse on the ground, a beam of light from outside the frame of reference illuminates him, and there is a rupture in his experience that is the uh, dawning awareness that there is another truth that he'd not yet apprehended and which he must now embrace. Um, that is not what we see here, not at all what we see here. And in fact, it makes me think that one should entertain the possibility that uh, by human hands and human relationships, gradually and in history, one can apprehend uh, the deeper the theological resonances, deeper theological truths. Um, that is a biblical, a, a, a Hebraic and Jewish way of approaching God through uh, his works and his creatures, um, rather, than be, rather than directly, rather than imminently, of the kind that we often think of uh, when we think of that kind of Christian conversion. That's, that's really quite lovely, John. And uh, I, I hadn't th 
thought about the subject in this way at all before, though I, I think the, your description of what actually happens in this story um, is uh, very much of that, of that sort. Uh, the, uh, we've talked about family. We haven't yet got to the crucial question of land and the relation of family to land um, and, um, and the redemption of the land. Uh, and we haven't gotten to the crucial question of the Leverate marriage and the obligation of redemption of brothers for uh, barren, dead bro uh, fallen uh, brothers who, who have died childless. Um, but um, the key, in a way, the key notion through the whole text is the notion of chesed. Um, hard to translate, usually translated loving kindness, but it's, it's more than a feeling. It really is a virtue of mind and heart. It depends on uh, perspicacity. It depends upon judgment. It is a certain way of being in the world toward other people. And um, it is, after all, one of God's attributes as he declares it in the revelation to Moshe in Exodus 34, Rav Chesed the Emet, uh, uh, abundant in Chesed and abundant in truth. And um, from Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik, uh, I was taught to translate Chesed as loyal devotion, loyalty and devotion, and also maybe a kind of gracious kindness, but it is a divine attribute. And it is Naomi, who it is, I'm sorry, it is Ruth who is praised for this virtue three times in this story. And there is a way in which you could say that she is, despite the fact that she is a foreigner, emphasized throughout, despite the fact that she's a foreigner from a despised nation and a descendant of an accursed beginning, she is in a way the bearer of this divine virtue into a community that desperately needs it, into a, into, to a woman who is despairing, whom she sustains through her chesed, to Boaz, whom she somehow inspires to do the right thing and to fulfill his obligation as redeemer. And she brings chesed into a community that is icy to the receipt of a returning Naomi who is cool to her, that has suffered because of iniquitous conduct so that the judges are working overtime or might themselves be corrupt. And by the end, the community is restored thanks to the gift of this angel of chesed. Um, and everybody somehow is, partakes of it in their new way uh, by the time the story is over. So there's something contagious in the way in which this foreigner, in her little small ways, um, it spreads through the community and is in fact, the community will ultimately be politically redeemed through her descendant, uh, King David. We're going to come in the course of our conversation to a pivotal moment uh, one evening on the threshing floor in which Ruth's chesed will again be something that we can learn from. For now, Leon, uh, let's enter into an earlier moment of the story when, in fact, Naomi and Ruth return to uh, Naomi's home and Boaz and Ruth meet for the first time. Tell us about that first meeting. Well, um, the, they return alone, these two women. They are destitute. Um, at the beginning of the second chapter, the, we, the text introduces us, tells us, by the way, Naomi really did have a kinsman, a relative of Elimelech, Boaz, uh, Ish Gibor Chayel, a mighty man of town. Um, and we expect that something might happen here, you know, somebody will come forward, but silence. Uh, he does nothing to uh, help the situation out. Instead, Ruth, somehow seeing the dire circumstances, asks permission to go gleaning uh, according to the law of Israel in which 
the fields are not harvested to the full, the corners are not harvested, the, the things that drop are left for the poor and the widows and the orphans and the strangers. And Naomi gives permission to Ruth to go and glean, Ruth volunteering so that Naomi does not have to somehow demean herself, the wife of a prominent man, formerly speaking, uh, to go gleaning herself. Um, I think Naomi's interested in sustenance, but Naomi um, has probably in the back of her mind thinking, aha, Ruth will now be seen in public. I'm not going to tell her anything about Boaz. I'm not going to prejudice her one way or the other. I'm not going to raise her hopes. But she allows her to go, go, my daughter. She blesses her. And she happens to land on the field that just happens to belong to Boaz, who just happens the day she's out there for the first time, happens to show up in his own field. And when you meet Boaz, he makes a very fine impression. The Lord be with you is his greeting to his workers. Um, he has the name of the Lord on his tongue and immediately he's struck by this foreign woman and he asks to have information uh, about her. And he's told a little bit about her and he addresses her for the first time. My daughter, do not go anywhere else. Stay always in my field. Follow my workers. Whatever you can glean is yours. Oh, and avail yourself of the water that they've drawn for themselves. And Ruth is astonished. She falls on her face in a kind of humble posture, probably with a red face of embarrassment, but she's not mousy. And she says to him, the first word out of her mouth is, why? Are you showering me with this treatment, seeing uh, as I am a foreign woman? Um, and she emphasizes her foreignness. Why this kindness? She rubs her foreignness in his face, and it's in a way a perfect test of his character. And he says, I know all about you. I know all that you have done for Naomi and the chesed that you practiced to the living and to the dead. Um, uh, feel free to, to, um, to glean here, uh, and you are welcome here, and you're to go to no other field. And shortly thereafter, um, and, and he praises her chesed, and basically what he's saying to her, what he's moved here to say is, your origin is to me less important than your character. I know your story. And by the way, I've told the young men not to uh, trouble you, to, to keep away from you, not to disturb you. You're to be protected here. Your, your ancestry is not your destiny in my eyes. Your chesed, your virtue, is what entitles you to welcome here. That's the first step towards Boaz legitimating her as a member of this people. And then he invites her to lunch and invites her into the group. And she's made a full member of the community. And finally, um, she goes away to glean and he tells the men, don't shame her, but drop extra stuff from her for the already bundled stuff. In this beautiful moment, with her gracious moment toward him, he comes in with the name of God on his tongue, but thanks to this little exchange, he's turned from a landowner into a giver. And so his conduct is right under your nose. Her chesed begets his chesed. And both of them have somehow been lifted up in this moment to a higher degree of, 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 of sanctity. Let me uh, ask something that Boaz said. Um, I know all about you and your chesed, Ruth. Your chesed toward the living and your chesed toward the dead. What does that mean? Um, the chesed towards the dead, I think, uh, refers to her loyalty to her um, dead husband. 
Uh, we didn't ask, why does Ruth actually go with Naomi? I mean, does she go because uh, out of pity? Does she go uh, because out of desperation herself? Does she go, as I think, also because she loves her character, that Naomi is goodness herself? But um, as Maurice Samuel put it, um, Naomi is the last link to the beloved dead. And in going with Naomi, and in way speaking of Naomi in terms of marriage, she is somehow keeping alive the bond to her dead husband, and that this is a way of honoring that relation as well. Um, so that she, and um, there is perhaps somehow a hope that that dead husband will not disappear without a trace. Certainly the relationship with Naomi is all that, that exists of it now. The other thing that Boaz says, which by the way is, shouldn't be lost sight of because it comes forward, um, because of her chesed, and not only encouraging her to glean, but he calls down God's blessing upon her. May you be successful in your gleaning. And then in this beautiful expression, may he spread his wing over you, kanaf. Um, that he's inspired by what he's heard of her, but also by the way she appears before him and her conduct. He's in, he's in a way summons God's blessing upon her and that God should spread his wing over her, I'm in a way doing that right now through my generosity in your gleaning. She will use this phrase later to, to call for more. Leon, the uh, notion that one's character means more, that Ruth's character means more to Boaz at that moment than her origins introduces a uh, uh, two tendencies, it seems to me, that are both present in the text that could lead the reader to be oriented in opposite directions. There's the idea that the decisions of one generation are formative, possibly even redemptive to future generations, and the corresponding idea that the sins of the past will make themselves felt in the future as well. But then we come to this idea. Zooming out, one can see that the deeds of the past do not forever influence the future indefinitely. The sins of the past eventually fade, and redemption from the stains of historical iniquity, in fact, are possible. Um, both of these two orientations toward the past and the future seem present here. Um, they're, they're present here, and... Um... But I think in this particular story, I mean, one doesn't, want, one doesn't want to forget that these sins are sins. And um, although Ruth the Moabitess is finally naturalized within the community, that doesn't mean that there's a kind of generalized teaching that we should now have cultural exchanges with the Moabites and that uh, all otherness is, that this is somehow the model of relation to the others. No, Moab, as we learn in this story, is still death to Israel. Um, but it's possible that even in iniquitous cultures, it's possible that the virtues that are esteemed in Israel can arise anywhere, even in wicked regimes. And Israel does itself proud when it recognizes that virtue and welcomes it and treats it with honor. And, and gives it the credit that it's due, not standing simply on, on ancient grievances or on ancient uh, iniquities. I think really um, the, the iniquity is not only on the side, of, by the way, of the Moabites and of Ruth, but Boaz himself springs from an iniquitous union. Boaz is the seventh generation of the union of Judah and Tamar, in which Tamar plays a harlot in order to get her father-in-law Judah to make good on his promise to bring his youngest son Shelah to do the leverate duty after his first two sons married to Tamar were killed for wickedness. And Judah sa saves his son because he's afraid of losing him, but Tamar playing the harlot comes, Judah goes in unto her, she conceives, 
They discover she's pregnant, they're ready to stone her, and she points out that Judah is the father of this child. Judah confesses she's more righteous than I, and the child of this union, one of them twins, one of them is Perez, the ancestor of Boaz. So through both of these lines, you have unions which are condemned in Leviticus in the Holiness Code of Forbidden Unions, and yet both of those unions, both of them undertaken by women who wanted to celebrate life rather than barrenness, both of those offspring are united here in a redemptive marriage from which comes Israel's greatest king. It means that redemption is possible in Israel even for the worst of offenses. But it's, it's not somehow guaranteed and somehow it has to be earned. It's not just redemption, I will redeem who I will redeem, but there's a way in which this redemption comes about by the presence of the rise of a godlike virtue in human beings. Okay, let's um, move forward in the story. Um, Leon, why don't at this point you tell us about the plan with which Naomi inspires Ruth and then what occurs on that much discussed, much debated evening on the thre threshing floor between Ruth and Boaz? Okay, um, when Ruth returns from the gleaming, gleaning um, with bushels of, of, of grain, uh, uh, um, uh, she, and she tells Naomi in whose field, uh, Naomi thinks this must be Bashert, this is Providence, um, she's just happened on a field of Boaz, and she tells Na Ruth the, for the first time, Boaz, Boaz is a goel, he's a near kinsman. Uh, Ruth doesn't have any idea what this means, but it means that um, this is a person who has an obligation in Israel to redeem our land, okay? Uh, she doesn't tell him very much, She's hoping after this great display of interest and kindness on the gleaning field, Boaz will come around for tea the next day. Nothing. Boaz doesn't show up. And Ruth uh, and Naomi is um, all this time thinking, how can we do something and why hasn't he come? And maybe he hasn't come because he doesn't want to force his old self on this young widow or he's afraid that he's going to be rejected, or he knows, as we will learn later, there's another guy in the, in the queue in front of him. But in any case, he doesn't show up, and the last harvest is over, so Naomi figures it's now or not till next year. So she tells Ruth, um, she tells him wonderful speech, as, as your dear mother, uh, should I not be thinking of finding you rest? And rest she uses in the masculine to mean husband. And Ruth doesn't say anything, so she says, And is there not Boaz in whose field you were gleaning, and fine print, who made such a fine impression on you? Tonight's the end of the harvest. They're going to have a party afterwards. Why don't you get dressed up, take a bath, anoint yourself, get dressed up, go down to the threshing floor, mark out a place where he's going to sleep, wait until he's had enough to eat and drink, and when he's asleep, lie down at his feet. And Ruth, like the children of Israel, uh, saying to Moses at Sinai, what you say, Naomi, I will do. And she goes, and she waits till he's had his dinner and had he... He has, he's merry with wine. I don't think he's drunk. He lies down and she lies down at his feet. And it looks, by the way, for all the world that Naomi is sending Ruth to play Lot's daughter to Boaz. I mean, to seduce him uh, when he's had too much to drink um, and so on and to offer herself. But the contrast couldn't be starker. Uh, Lot's daughter lies with her father. Uh, Ruth lies at his feet. Boaz is not hung over. She's not playing some harlot like Tamar to Judah. Boaz wakes up and he says, Who are you? 
And um, for the first time in the book, Ruth utters her name. I am Ruth, your handmaiden. Spread your wing over me. Um, for you are a goel, you are a redeemer. Just as Boaz had earlier uh, had earlier blessed Ruth that God should spread his kanaf over her, now he t- now she too asks that his kanaf be spread over her the same. Before you implied that your allowing me to glean was a form of divine um, uh, protection. Now I invite you to complete that by being our Redeemer. And the marvelous thing in this, in this scene is two forms of redemption are combined. She's offering herself to him as a spouse, and she's also reminding him that he has a duty of redemption to the uh, alienated land that belonged to Elimelech and that fell to his heirs, including her dead husband, Mahlon. And Boaz, um, and as an old man, uh, I sort of can easily inhabit his soul at this particular point. Um, He, by the way, Naomi had told her, offer yourself there at his feet and he'll tell you what to do. But Ruth, Ruth tells him what to do. And he basically says to her, what you have said, I will do. And your chesed that you have practiced me tonight is greater than you have practiced before, that you have come to me rather than after the young men. Boaz understands she could have chosen anybody but that she has chosen him amongst the other men. It's miracle of miracles, wonder of wonders. She has chosen me. And whatever hesitation he had had before about the marriage, he tells her, I will do what you ask. Wait here, go home over the cover of darkness. We will not disgrace you. In the morning, I will fix it. Okay. We now need to explain, Leon, the practice and uh, of leveret marriage and yibum because the upswelling of chesed and devotion that Ruth has promised to Boaz and that Boaz wishes in turn to bestow upon Ruth require a public and legal negotiation. Boaz, you point out, is not, uh, you and Chana point out in the book, is not free and clear to wed Ruth because she has a closer relative. Why don't you just explain this uh, Israelite institution? Well, there, there are actually in, in, the, in, the, in the Torah, there are two separate institutions, one having to do with procreation and one having to do with land. Um, and they're not actually technically put together in Israelite law until the rabbis do it Uh, in the Talmudic times. But they're both put together by Boaz here by anticipation, and it's quite gorgeous. The practice of leverate marriage is announced in, in, in Deuteronomy. If a man dies without an heir, his brother is obliged to marry his widow and to raise up a son upon his name so that his name, the dead husband's name, will not disappear in Israel. So, uh, and uh, brothers are obliged to do this duty of Yibum, of leverate, to be the levier, to practice a leverate marriage, the first child of which is understood to be the heir of his dead brother. Brothers are called to be their brother's keeper and not to somehow be indifferent, never mind take pleasure in the fact that their brother, their older brother or their younger brother, once upon a time a rival, is now gone from the scene. Um, and it's, it's, it's not compulsory, you can get out of it, 
but it's a disgrace to refuse. And we don't have to go into the ceremony, but in which the widow sort of spits in the man's face, slaps him with the shoe, and says, this is a man who will not perform this mitzvah for his brother, okay? That's the technical leverate obligation. It falls only on brothers. Boaz is not a brother to dead Machlon. He is a kinsman of the dead Elimelech. But he and uh, other, any other relative are under an obligation of geula, of redemption, applying to the land. That's told in Leviticus. If a man is so poor that he has to sell his land, his relatives are, it's not an absolute obligation, but it's pretty close. They are encouraged, enjoined to buy his ban land back from him. Why? Because it's terribly important in Israel that no family should be alienated from its portion of the promised land. Israel is to be a place where families exist in perpetuity and their attachment to the promised land as a family exists in perpetuity. Begetting and belonging are two essential and mutually important things. Um, so, um, and uh, that, that obligation of redeeming the land is not in Leviticus tied to siring children. So um, what happens here is Ruth has in a way put on offer on the threshing floor a marriage to me as the widow of Machlon and, uh, the, and of the uh, uh, widowed son of, of Naomi. And she's called him a goel, which, which refers to the redemption of the alienated land. And when, when Boaz, to the story we should, we should now turn, goes the next day into the gate to arrange the legal arrangement with witnesses, he's going to accomplish both things. But he begins, he begins by emphasizing the thing for which he is legally obligated, namely the redemption of the land. And um, if you want to look at this together now, I, I think that's the place where thanks to R Ruth's ingenuity and um, scene of chesed, she inspires Boaz to do more than he, what was he obliged and in a way to set forth the teaching of the book of Ruth about the fact that land is not just alienated real estate and families are not just nuclear families that wander where they will, but there's a way of life here that links perpetuation of a teaching in the family and attachment to the land which lives under laws of a community that aspire to do God's way uh, in the world. Okay, I want to, uh, we're, we're getting, running uh, close to the end of our time, Leon, um, but I want to dwell for a moment as we've dwelled on the names of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, on the name of this person who uh, was formerly next in line, but whom Boaz has persuaded uh, to step aside for himself. Um, this person is famously called in the text Poloni Almoni. What does that mean and what is the significance of that name? Uh, Poloni Almoni would be like John Doe, or hey you, uh, so and so, literally. And um, um, look, there, there are lots of reasons why somebody might be unnamed or referred to uh, by uh, a kind of generic uh, name, fill in the blank. Uh, it could be because he's an everyman character. It could be because he's done nothing special. It could be because he's in fact, uh, um, refused an opportunity to just do so, something special and we're in a way covering his shame by not reporting who he's done. But, um, and um, Plony Elmoni in a way behaves in this story so that he deserves not to be named. That is to say, he, um, 
he bites for half of the redemption when it looks like he's going to get this extra real estate. But when um, Boaz, in a way, inventing the law, legislating, because it's not in the existing law, says, oh, by the way, when you take this land, uh, comes with this land, um, Ruth, the Moabitess, the, the wife of the dead Machlon. I mean, it's a pretty grim picture. And Plony Almoni panics and says, uh, you do the honors, Boaz. Um, so uh, there um, Plony Almoni shows himself like most of us, like most ordinary person. Um, how many people put in Plony Almoni's place would take up this um, unfortunate, destitute wife, uh, Moabite wife, um, uh, in order to uh, do your duty by the land. Uh, so he's in a way set off against the real virtue of Boaz, the way Orpah is set off against the real virtue of Ruth. He's an ordinary guy. We shouldn't be too tough on him. We should not be too tough on him, but there is a connection with the larger uh, writings of Leon Cass that I want to dwell on for a moment. Um, with your late and beloved wife, Amy, you once wrote an essay about names and reflected that the conferral of a name upon a child is a way to remind that child uh, that they come from somewhere else, that they were uh, the product of forethought and care, and that they have an obligation to perpetuate that a gift that they were given, um, that this person, when confronted with the possibility of marriage and child rearing, should be um, so consciously unnamed, would seem to um, would seem to be related to that thought. That's lovely. That's lovely. Um, it's uh, he rejects a marriage um, and loses ceases to be the patron of the institution which is responsible for his own name. Uh, of course, he got his own name for his parents, but he hasn't somehow appreciated of what it means to pay forward those kinds of gifts and what it means, especially in Israel, where the relation among the generations is sacrosanct, not in biological terms, but in cultural and in spiritual terms. Why does the story have to end, as it does, with childbirth? Um, well, um, I would say the birth of the child is the occasion for the birth of a child of a special child. It's a special child. It's a child which... Um, Look, the, the beginning, there was a famine in Israel and there was barrenness in Moab. God is invoked uh, in the story to have accomplished two things. Uh, Naomi heard that God had brought an end to the famine when she starts her way back. And everybody declares that God has brought this child to Ruth. So the divine hand is seen in fertility, both of land and of human beings. The birth of a child is a sign that the famine and the blight on generation has ended. The birth of a child is the redemption of two stained lines that began with tainted origins in, in Moab and, um, and with Judah and Tamar. The birth of a child is the celebration of uh, the redemptive chesed in which Boaz, who is the leading man in town, has in a way legislated for the whole community that chesed counts more than yichas, counts more than origin and lineage and, 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 and cultural origins. And that um, uh, the community which at the beginning welcomed Ruth and Naomi in the most cold and casual way that didn't help them out in their impoverishment, 
the chorus of men are roused to sing great praise of Boaz. The chorus of women are um, celebrating, uh, may, may, may this woman be like Ruth and Naomi and a fountain of, of, of Israel. And um, they, in fact, when they see in this beautiful moment, when Naomi grasps this child to her bosom as a symbolic act of motherhood or of at least adoption. The chorus is sort of overjoyed and says, a child is born to Naomi and the community names this child Oved, serving. And then we get the story that he will be the grandfather, the father of Jesse, the grandfather of David so that the community itself is healed and this birth of this special child, a child born of a restoration of chesed to the community, brought to the community by this stranger. So now let, let me uh, turn to the, to the last thing I want to ask you about. Um, the reading Ruth is the, um, offers readers a commentary, as we've just discussed, of this most delightful book, from the Hebrew Bible. Of course, the genesis of the book um, grew out of uh, personal circumstances. Um, Hannah Mandelbaum is not a random co-author. She's your granddaughter. And the book comes together uh, originally because the two of you began to study Ruth in the aftermath of the, uh, the death of your late wife and her grandmother, Amy Apfel Cass, um, much beloved, much missed, even by students of hers and readers of hers. Um, it's, I, I want to just ask you to reflect on how you honor her, uh, how you and Hannah honor her in the study and authoring of this book. Um, thanks, John, for bringing this up. It's, um, this book is, along with the couple of projects I did with Amy, this project is the dearest to me of anything I've done in my professional life, partly because the deed of working on it across the generations fits so very well with what we're discovering in and through the book. Um, this, uh, the, the project began within a couple of months after Amy passed away. Hannah was 16, living in Jerusalem. I'm in Washington, D.C., and she said to me, Zeta, that's what she calls me, grandfather in Yiddish, maybe you'd like to read something with me. And this was, uh, as I say in the preface, this was, this was a log to a drowning man. And for the next three months on FaceTime, a couple of hours a week, we would do one or two sentences at a time, reading it aloud in Hebrew and English, just trying to make the thing come to life. And it was Hannah who rediscovered an insight that Amy and I had had 25 years ago that we thought would unlock the whole book and that uh, I forgot to write down and didn't remember and hoped that we would find it again. And I began to take notes and in any case, to make a long story short, the thing got written up, it went through multiple drafts, Hannah went into the Israeli Air Force, things were delayed, but, and we sent it around to people, we read a few things. But this book not only offers an interpretation, but it offers um, every bit as much a reading in the sense of an experience of reading. We're not just laying something out but we're reading it and we're writing down the questions we have and the puzzlements we have and the things that we're leaving for the reader to ponder. And only at the end in the last 10 pages do we offer what we think to be what we can learn from this book of importance for redemption and the place of procreation in the way of Israel. But so, and as Hannah points out, in her own personal note at the back of the book, um, the spirit of Amy sort of hovered over our work. Amy taught texts read line by line, 
read for what they might teach us about the enduring and permanent questions of life. Uh, she read texts in search of their wisdom, and as Hannah says, that she felt her presence, as did I, during the entire time of writing. And um, it really goes forth into the world as a tribute to her way of teaching, her way of being. Um, I felt the re-embodiment of Amy's chesed in my granddaughter's chesed to me and feel it still. Leon Cass, uh, with our gratitude to you and to Hannah, you should, have, uh, you should have a lovely Shavuot, and with all of our gratitude for this terrific book. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, John. All blessings on you. Thank you very much.